You can do it. One, two, three. It, it works. Yeah, yeah. Does yours work too? Counted for yes. One, two, three. Uno, dos, tres. One, two, three. One, two, three. Look where this is going. Can yeah. we continue? Yeah. Well, we just said officially the slot starts at 3.50, right? And if we start 10 minutes early and people are actually, I'm not sure if anybody waits for us. I mean, shall we go ahead of time? You get more questions as a bonus towards the end. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good point too. But sounds good. We'll do it. All right, folks, quick question, because obviously you can hear by our accent and I'm sure you have guessed by our names that we are not from Chicago. <laughs> um, any, any Austrians in the house? Any Austrians? No, we're the only one. Oh, over there. Over there. Servus, awesome. wo bist du? I'm not personally Austrian. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> All right. Close enough. Yeah. It's a good one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Have you been to Austria? All right. You should. So do we get anybody that is at least a little bit closer? Has anybody been to Austria before? Define Austrian, right? <laughs> well, define Does Sweden count? <laughs> oh my god, we have a different problem than backstage here to solve. <laughs> awesome. So we are from the lovely country of Austria. It's not Australia. We always say cows, not kangaroos. <clears throat> Some other facts that people may not know about Austria. Mm. Red Bull is Austrian. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Even though I think, to be honest, I think uh, Mr. Mateschitz, who passed away like two years ago, but he kind of screwed his business partner from Thailand back then, and he became really famous with it. But still, we claim the fame. What else do we have? Arnold Schwarzenegger, obviously. Schwarzenegger, Mozart. Mozart. Beethoven, even though he's German. Yeah. Uh, the Wiener Schnitzel. Wiener Schnitzel. Yeah. Sachertorte. Sachertorte, here we go. Yeah. All about food. Yeah. So exactly. But uh, we're not here to talk about food. We're here to talk about backstage. And the way we're going to do this, um, we have kind of two parts. Wolfgang, you will bring us through the kind of the journey uh, from backstage at Dynatrace. And then I, in the end, uh, kind of wrap it up with a little bit of the observability aspect of backstage, because we are an observability company. And I do a lot of uh, advising uh, around observability of platforms. I'm uh, a platform engineer, so I want to just bring in my perspective. But I want to push it over to you now, because I think you have a great story to tell and a good analogy <laughs> of our journey towards Backstage. Awesome, yeah, thank you. And thanks for the intro. And actually, I think this is a historic moment, since even though we've been working together for over 10 years, it's the first time we're on stage together. It's true, yeah. It's interesting. Anyway, uh, thanks for, for joining us and putting up with our rambling. Um, I have two acknowledgments or two, two things to acknowledge. Uh, first, if you've read the abstract, there's another colleague mentioned in there, a guy called Bernd. So, hi, if you watch the recording. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it here. Um, that's why we have Andy. And the second thing to mention is uh, back then when we put together the abstract and came up with the title, How We Made Back Backstage Improve Developer Efficiency of a Thousand Plus Engineers, we might have been a bit overly optimistic with the speed of our backstage adoption and uh, have to be honest that we're not quite there yet. We're on a pretty good trajectory, I would say. Um, but yeah, we haven't yet met that number. So if you're here because of that fabulous story, unfortunately, I, I have to disappoint you. Um, anyway, speaking of analogies, I didn't want to go with that it's a marathon, not a sprint thing. I wanted to compare it with my wonderful COVID project I did together with my wife, tiling my basement floor which was also a thing I expected to be done much sooner than it actually did. <laughs> so that is, we've got that going for us. Um, so yeah, in this case, let's seal up, put on the Schwarzenegger gear and get started. So how, how we started on, on our move and on our path towards establishing a developer portal at Dynatrace. Um, a few years ago, Dynatrace was a company where pretty much all of the devs were working in a few large monorepos. Uh, you pushed code either to the agent part, which is um, the stuff running on our customer side, or to the server side part, which was a, or is a huge monorepo consisting of 260 Gradle projects. And um, you didn't have to worry about anything. You just pushed the code in there. Versioning was done, delivery was done, um, also hot fixes and so on, all of that was already cared for. Um, there are downsides to that. Over time, the project kept growing and growing. We had to put in way more effort to keep it fast and maintainable. And eventually, there was the time when Dynatrace decided we want to move towards the Dynatrace platform. 
And um, that is a, a new product, product where um, we provide apps that are built on top of the platform. And the homework for us was, I was back then in a team that was a central part of Dynatrace where we maintained the internal CI, so the infrastructure and provided a lot of guidance around how to build and test stuff. And the challenge for us was how to keep up with that. Back then, in previous times, creating a new project for needed um, somebody to create the repository, create the Jenkins build, create some basic uh, build scripts. That didn't happen too often, so it was fine to do that manually, and then we had to figure out how we can keep up with that. And for us, the idea was in about mid-2020, um, let's write something on our own where we can do templating, because Backstage was just released, what did we hear earlier, March 2020? So we decided not to go with that brand new project that we didn't fully trust at the time, uh, but decided to roll with our own. And we called it the Project Initializer. It was a tool that you could use to create a template that did all the repository creation, templating, and so on for you. We had a couple of nice features in there where uh, if a template changes, you get updates for on, on your project that you created in the form of a pull request, for example. We had an approval feature in there, so if somebody wanted to start something, somebody had to approve it. And that worked. Um, so we were heading not really towards chaos, but um, it was used quite frequently and people were, were happy with it. But it showed that we were lacking something. We were very focused, as I said, on, on the templating and on the scaffolding, and eventually we realized, okay, let, let's stop that. We saw that templating is not enough. There were so many open questions that we couldn't answer with the tool that we had provided, and the question was, do we want to invest further into improving our homegrown tooling, or do we want to move towards Backstage? And since we're at BackstageCon and not InitializerCon, I guess you can imagine how that decision turned out. So we got together in that group of, of uh, people running that internal team. We call it engineering productivity, so that the guys that are working on, on our Jenkins and build infrastructure and so on. And we said, um, what do we want to know? Where do we start? Again, my tiles in the basement, where to start? We start at the door, so we start at the beginning like a lot of other companies, as we also heard today, ownership, the big question, who is responsible for something in a component or a service, who is taking care about it? Which resources do we need? Which APIs are used? Uh, where is the documentation? Where is it actually deployed? Um, a build screen? Where can I find the self-monitoring data? All of that was um, something we couldn't really answer with the tooling we had. So we decided to move towards Backstage. In our case, now we have a screenshot of Backstage itself, uh, where we have all of those things covered. We have ownership, we have a link to our self-monitoring, um, we have the documentation linked from here, um, yeah, and the other plugins for CI/CD monitoring for the Docker images with, together with the security vulnerabilities and so on, we have that in use as well. The great thing was that at this time we didn't only adopt it um, in our own um, team and on, in that group of, of engineering productivity folks, but also teams from the, um, in that case, the ActiveGate, so one of the Dynatrace components, also started to adopt it and uh, onboard the, the services and the projects in there. So that was pretty cool. We also moved on to integrate existing tools. Um, at Dynatrace, we have something called Dynatrace Teams, which is a web application that you can use to navigate the organizational structure of Dynatrace. So you can look for users, you can look for teams, and of course, we didn't want to maintain that structure again in Backstage, so we built an integration to sync everything in there, which was already quite a cool achievement then that you can see a team from teams, um, what, what is owned by this team and, and uh, didn't have to worry about getting the users in there, getting the right team name in there and so on. We also use Stack Overflow, for example, so we also integrated that with, our, with the search in, in, in Backstage. So in that, that engineering productivity group, we were quite happy, and we thought, okay, how to grow, how to continue with, with my tiles, and how to, how to go on with that. And we had a couple of conversations that pretty much went this way with, hey, we've got something, it's called Backstage, why don't they use it? And the response, more often than not, was, was why? What, what, what do I get from it? Oops, sorry. Um, that took us a bit by surprise, so um, again, we, we put our heads together and defined a bit of a process for us where we said that that also came together with my 
a role change towards a product manager. So I said, okay, let's treat it like, like a product. Let's look at it um, a bit more um, product oriented, identify the stakeholders we want to work with, think about the user journeys, what are they doing, what are they supposed to do, are we solving the problems that they actually have, and then start small and iterate. Once again, we looked at our Dynatris platform and um, tried to figure out which part we can contribute most, which part of that platform is the one where we would have the most impact. And it was the, the top level called the Dynatris apps, um, where we want to support with self-service solutions and more automation for creating and maintaining apps. So for that uh, part of the product, there is a documentation page called developer.dynatris.com um, where you can see how you can write an app, okay? Um, and we want to automate that. So we um, want to provide a workspace template that then, then triggers the, the repo creation via a GitOps approach for GitHub. And then we want to move towards an automatic deployment in our development environment, provisioning a workspace in a remote IDE. So we use Gitpod for that. So the idea is to be able to start the app, get the repo, and immediately connect to the, to the workspace in Gitpod, and also set up the self-monitoring automatically. However, there are a few hurdles on that way that I would like to talk about now. So on the one hand, um, as we started initially with our initializer, um, there are a lot of existing projects that we need to onboard and that is manual effort that needs to be done. So in our case, once again for the apps, an app uses an SDK and the SDK depends on, on an API. There are already a few of that. And um, now manually creating all the catalog info is something we don't want to do. Uh, we built some initial automation, how we can onboard them and how we can get them into backstage, but that is one of the bigger hurdles right now that we need some automation to really consistently automate not only the SDK onboarding, but also the app onboarding. The apps are NPM based, so there is a lot of info already in the package JSON that we would also like to use to put it right in the, in the backstage catalog. The other thing that we saw um, with onboarding when people are doing it, it can be quite difficult um, to get the format right. So what we consistently try to ed educate people on is to use the entity validator to see um, if the, the format is correct and also have the, the entity checks right um, visible next to the component to see that whatever you put in is complete and fulfills the, the needs that we have. Where is my water? For the people that just come in and think, why are they already talking? Because officially the talk started two minutes ago. We were a little bit ahead of time here in the conference and we started early so we have more time for questions. And you can also ask, what did we miss in the first 10 minutes? Well, we can give you the recording, I guess, we, right? We'll just tell you again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay, so first hurdle was manual effort for onboarding. The second hurdle is uh, that we have a need for more complex templating workflows. So as, as said earlier, we had our own approach to templating in our initializer, which had a couple of features. Um, one, them, one of them also was to be able to wait for something to happen in another system. Uh, for example, that was where we built our approval on top, so you could create the pull request and somebody had to approve it, which is something that we can't do right now in Backstage. So there is an open GitHub issue uh, where we're also planning to contribute to make um, to enable gates in templates to make it possible to wait for a PR to be merged, for, for, for a user to provide input, or also for some other resource to be created, for example. Right now, this is what's limiting us from adopting Backstage further, since in a lot of cases we depend on some GitOps approach, so that means that in order to proceed with the template, you know, with the scaffolding, we need to be able to wait for a PR, and um, yeah, that is something that we will have to invest in. And last but not least, uh, what we saw is, especially during that initial phase when, when we started to use Backstage, there was some, some good traction. There were teams that were looking into it quite, quite early. And then we changed something, and something didn't work anymore. And then we changed something again, and people were not really frustrated, but there was a certain degree of feedback, like, you want us to use it, don't break it all the time. <laughs> and we said, yeah, okay, that's actually a nice thing, and that is where I'd like to hand over to, to Andy to talk about uh, why observability matters in that case. Cool, so uh, Wolfgang, you basically, as you said earlier, you changed your role from what you did a couple of years ago to then kind of like a product management role where your product is 
the IDP or the back, backstage and you want to make sure that this product is actually running and is adopted and you want to make sure everything works smoothly. Exactly. In yeah. my, my PM role, I'm responsible for the internal processes that take code from development to production based on, on our platform and backstage is a key component of that. Yeah. Quick show of hands, who in the room here is responsible for running backstage and also making sure it keeps running and it keeps your users happy? All right. Are you guys monitoring and observing how your backstage is running, how it is used, who is using it? Yeah? Just a little fewer hands, hopefully. Uh, a couple of tips that I have. First of all, for us, yeah, like so la la, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Well, monitoring means when people start screaming at my door, then I know something is wrong. That's an, an, op, an, an approach, but not the best one. So the, the test that, that kind of we, or I try to figure out in the, for this talk is how can we make backstage observable? Fortunately, we have a lot of observability opportunities, especially on Kubernetes. I'm sure I don't need to remind you what uh, open telemetry is, what Prometheus is, that you have a lot of logs that are created Kubernetes events. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoy and I learn a lot from, and this is just a little commercial to uh, isitobservable.io, one of our colleagues, Henrik, uh, his mission is to actually look at all of the different technology in the cloud native space whether it's open telemetry, Prometheus logs, to make things like service meshes, to make things like critical components to our platform, like Backstage and others observable, and then use this data to answer critical questions, like is it available all the time? How many users are using it? Can we optimize the performance? And what about all the other depending systems? Because Backstage is not a standalone island. It needs other systems, and when they are down, then we all have a problem. So to give you just a couple of tricks and also what we use internally. One of the things we do is we're detecting, based on the logs that Backstage creates, common misconfigurations and misusage. Right? I think you mentioned earlier that people might get frustrated if all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore, it doesn't work as expected. The question is, is the system the problem or the way they use the system? Right? And so uh, what we have here is just like based on, uh, based on rules that you can also apply, uh, whatever log analytics solution you have, assuming you have logs, you get the logs from Backstage, you pull it into a log analytics solution, you can extract exactly these top problems that we have seen in our organization as it comes to Backstage. And you can then use this data to say, hey, Either you have templates that are simply wrong and somebody's using the wrong templates, so you need to fix the templates, or somebody's using the templates wrong, which results into errors, and you want to also avoid that. Log data can give you this information. By the way, we share the slides later on, so you can obviously take a picture of these queries and of these examples, but we'll also share it so it will be easier. So, very simple, figure out if something is wrong in Backstage based on configuration. The next thing, and this is a very simple one, I've been working in observability for the last 15 years, and we have some very simple means to validate things like, is the service up and running? Some simple things like a synthetic monitor. So looking at the folks again that raised your hands earlier that are responsible for backstage, you need to treat backstage as any other business critical system that you have. Whether it's your company.com where you actually make money, Backstage is as important because your developers are very critical. We heard earlier how costly it is to lose developers if they are getting frustrated. And developers would cost a lot of money too. So you want to make sure they are productive and they can use the tools. Therefore, setting up a simple synthetic monitor with whatever tool you have that tells you is Backstage up and running. So you don't need to wait for people knocking on the door or leaving the company because their productivity is not good because of all these tools. So a simple synthetic monitor is really easy to set up. Whatever, as many tools out there, we obviously use our own product, but you can use whatever you want. Just a good tip. Next thing is real user monitoring. You said you want to know who is using it, right? Because you're talking with people, you talk to the, uh, our development platform team, uh, I mean, the, the, for, the, for the developing damage with exactly. apps, right? And you want to then actually know, are people actually using it? Where do people, from which different engineering locations, as you can see here, we are, we're heavily, uh, engineering is heavily based in Europe and in Austria and in Poland. So we can actually use real user monitoring data to figure out if our colleagues are really going to backstage and what they're doing in backstage. Are they really using the latest features that we've just pushed out through an internal 
blog post through an internal educational meeting. Another tip not, not, sorry, not only for monitoring whether people are actually using it, but also to have some metric to, uh, to track usage uh, and also to be able to argue why we invest in that area, why we, we have to have something like Backstage to have a developer portal. If nobody is using it, okay, um, why, why do we put all that effort in? And that's why it's really helpful to be able to track the adoption in, 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 in one place. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, no, it's good. That's, um, then the other thing is, um, from a performance perspective, I'm sure you're all frustrated if you try to use a tool and it takes forever to load and it doesn't do the job. So performance optimization is as equally important to tools like Backstage or any other tools you have in your platform than for your business critic lab. So you can leverage your real user monitoring data, you can leverage your built-in browser tools to actually figure out why are things slowing, uh, very slow to load, and then combine this with what you mentioned earlier, open telemetry to figure out what is slow within Backstage. Maybe there's a problem on Backstage itself or the depending components. And coming to the depending components, Backstage is not an island that is on its own because it needs and depends on many other systems. So what you see here is one of the visualizations of a distributed trace. So what you should figure out is how do you get your open telemetry data from Backstage to all the other tools it connects to so that you have enough evidence to AC. Oh my God, we just introduced a couple of plugins. They all now have dependencies to tools we've never thought about. You actually see where things slow down, where things break. Because if you are bringing Backstage into the organization, you're not only responsible for Backstage, that little component, but you're responsible for the end-to-end -end experience that you provide to your developers. And that includes everything from Backstage to Git to whatever else you are connecting with Backstage. And I think with this, it's a, hopefully a couple of observability tips and tricks. Remember logs, you can figure out misconfiguration. Setting up a synthetic monitor to validate that your Backstage is up and running, and if it's not up and running, then you can react proactively and not wait until developers knock on your door. Then figure out who is actually adopting it. Uh, and then performance optimization is a good thing, and making sure that you understand all of the dependencies. Every plugin will make your deployment more complex, also more powerful, but also more complex. And with this, I hope this is good enough, great data for a product manager like you to actually that is responsible for something like Backstage to then not only build a beautiful product, but also to get the adoption up and with this, finish your project. And, and see where we go next and what, exactly. we, what we do next. Exactly. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have reached the stage where we can think about putting stuff back in. Um, what are the next steps? What, what do we put in? So for us, it will be more automation supporting the onboarding for NPM-based apps. So as I said, our, our apps that we, we would like to see in Backstage. We are working on the prerequisites to make sure that we are actually able to also cover the various aspects when it comes to SDKs and other, other libraries that are, that are needed. Second for us is extending the templating capabilities, so the gating I talked about to enable Backstage to wait for PRs um, before proceeding with the templating to allow us to proceed with our GitOps use cases. And the third internal topic is establishing Backstage as the cornerstone for developing internal Dynatrace apps based on uh, the tool chain that we provide around GitHub and GitHub Actions. So what are the key takeaways? First. As I said, it's important to treat the IDP like a product, not as maybe we did earlier, think, uh, think about it like something that is um, working as a side project and um, takes us to the second takeaway, build it and they will come, does not work. At least in our case, we've seen that uh, the, the intrinsic drive of people to change their behavior uh, is, is not as high as, as we expected. Third for me was accept that it takes time. It is a huge change uh, when it comes to adopting and adapting um, the workflows in the company, in the dev team, uh, not to act too intrusive and maybe get adverse reactions. It is important to also acknowledge that it is a huge change and that, that takes time. And the fourth is apply observability in the same way as you do on your business apps. As I said, it's a product. You have to treat it like one and, and take it seriously. QR codes for the feedback is up. With that, we come to the end. My basement is done. I can put my bike back in. And my lemon tree, which has died in the meantime. Um, anyway, 
that's it from us. Thank you. If you have any questions, we have time left. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you. Do we have any questions? Let's go. Hi, uh, thanks for a good presentation. How long did this journey take for you? Um, after realizing that we don't want to continue with our internal development efforts, we started deploying Backstage, I think, mid last year. So a bit over a year, I would say. And the TALS project? Sorry? How long the TALS project? The TILE project, how long? The TILE project, uh, the TILE project that, whew, that started in December 2019, and I think the last thing was done in June. So that was also <laughs> longer than expected. But and I realized that things take time. You have to let it set. You have to dry stuff. And so it was, I underestimated it. <laughs> Any other questions? I have the mic. Um, there was a part where you're talking about like your onboarding workflow and things like once the process changes, right, as it evolves, how do you keep um, how do you keep things in line for the apps that have already applied the old workflows or the old skeletons? How do you make sure that as you evolve the workflows and onboarding, you keep those apps that already applied them in line with the new changes? Because that's a big problem that we have that we don't have solutions for. That is also one thing we are, we are working on uh, right now in our old system, which was used for a lot of the, these apps already. Uh, we have the way to take updates that are done on the template and push it out to ensure that things are in line with what we change on the templating side. Um, currently, our, our approach is more to move towards renovate, to extract things that we want to keep in line to some library that we can update, either, um, for example, as a Jenkins shared pipeline library or with a move towards GitHub Actions to separate it there and to be able to update this not via, via actually changing the template, but uh, by extracting that from the template and making it a, a normal version update that you can do through other mechanisms. But it would be interesting to learn more how, how you are tackling that. Maybe we can chat afterwards. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm just curious with your, um, with, with implementing Backstage and Dynatrace, are you just displaying the Dynatrace info in Backstage or are you actively creating some kind of processor to create the dependency graph? Or how, how do you how do you utilize that within your org? I think that is actually more a question towards you. Yeah, if you if you're talking about how we bring our observability data from our product back in, so we actually had um, Telus is one of our customers in like a telecom in, in Canada. They started like a year or so ago building a plugin for Backstage to bring in Dynatrace data. They actually now contributed that plugin to Dynatrace, so we now took over that plugin and we will extend it to bring in more information. Like, we, as you, I'm not sure, I guess you know Dynatrace maybe, yeah? So we have our dependency model, we have obviously have uh, our metrics, logs, and traces, so our goal is that we bring exactly the, the relevant observability data onto the right components in Backstage so that you don't have to always find this data in Dynatrace, but you get it. And there's a plugin already out there, and as I said, it was initially developed by Telus. They contributed it or they pushed it back to Dynatrace and now we're taking over and we have a certain road. Maybe it would be interesting to have a discussion because I can then bring it back to our product team to see what your thoughts are. Yeah. Any other questions? Ooh. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.